The town of Durham in Great County, Ontario was founded by Archibald Hunter, a Scot from Kilbarton, uh, Renfrewshire, Scotland. He was the second of 11 children, born to Archibald and Elizabeth Squire Hunter. His parental grandparents were Archibald and Janet Kerr Hunter. Uh, Kilbarshan was a weaving town. Like his father and grandfather, Gilbrohim, Archibald uh, learned the trade of hand looming, a cottage industry. So here we have uh, Archibald Hunter, his father and grandfather before him were also named Archibald, and they're they also weavers, hand, hand, hand loom weavers. And for some, for some reason in those days, the weavers were often referred to as leaders, leaders and reform movements. Archibald the third, Baldy they called him, was no exception. I'm going to put my glasses on. <laughs> That's better. For some reason, weavers have often been leaders in reform movements. Archibald III Baldy was no exception. One circumstance which disturbed him was the power of landowners held in the, uh, held in the country. One property owner, uh, only property owners could vote. But with industrial changes, the population has shifted from rural areas to urban. New communities uh, uh, might have a few or no representation, while others, ones that have fewer, fewer inhabitants, I continue to have several members on Parliament, so nothing has changed. We're still working, we're still working under this, this system. Uh, Archibald resented the injustice of the system, and, 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 he, and evidently he, he did not keep his thoughts to himself. With several others in the district, he spent some time in Durance Isle, uh, in, in the Paisley Jail, expressing his opinions on the questions of the day. Uh, the first reform, the first reform bill, uh, the first reform bill of 1832 uh, ended the, the Rotten Borough grievance. Hmm. Uh, as factories took took over the work of the cottage weavers, many left the village of Paisley. It seems odd that we have a Paisley near here, and they had a Paisley where he lived, where he lived in Scotland. Uh, Archibald and his wife Elizabeth Hill seen greater opportunities in the New World, decided to try their fortune there. In 1841, with her seven children, could you imagine leaving Scotland in 1841 with seven children? There were uh, of, of, uh, four boys, four boys and three girls. And the youngest boy, uh, who I portrayed yesterday in the fray, was uh, James, Hill, uh, uh, James Hill Hunter, the man who, the man who built the hedges, and uh, the one I was portraying yesterday. I would, I would actually ever portrayed his son, the colonel, and his father was, uh, was Archibald's younger son. He was, he was an infant, one year old, when he immigrated from Scotland to, to, uh, to, to, to New York State. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, in, in 1841, with their seven children, they sailed probably to New York. Uh, they, uh, they went to Herkimer, Herkimer upstate. Herkimer is a little, little a little uh, uh, area in, uh, in upstate New York near Syracuse, not far from the South Shore in Lake Ontario. And uh, it was also a weaving town. So he went there deliberately, I guess, so many he could get a job there before he found his way uh, up here. Went to Herkimer. Uh, after a year there, Archibald referred, uh, preferring to remain a British subject, and made plans to go to, to, go to Upper Canada. Uh, Ontario, of course, Upper Canada before 1867, to settle. Free grants of land, 50 acres, were being offered in the newly surveyed Green's Bush. Here was a chance for a fresh start, a new life in a new country. In the spring of 42, he set out. Uh, uh, here was his oldest, his oldest son, William, uh, 18 years old, and a Mr. Pullen, and a Mr. Jameson, and his son, his teenage son. Uh, the road from Fergus to Georgian Bay had been surveyed the previous year. It was hardly, it was hardly a road, it was barely a trail. This is the, you know, the, the Garifraps road. But it, it was first shortly after the survey. It, it, was, still, it was still pretty rough. And uh, one, of, one, of the, one of the surveyors, surveyors team told them that they had the best farming land to be found. Uh, 
by following the road, the Garifrafta. He said, go to the big soggy river, he advised them, and you will find, uh, find, you will find a heavy timber, national soil, and good water. What more could you want? After getting as much attention as they could about the conditions of the journey, and, and buying the supplies over the again on the way, they were eager to start. <clears throat> but once they were delayed, however, uh, at least at least a day, when, when the two lads, uh, exploring on their own, became lost in the forage in the forest around Oakville. When they uh, when, when they left Herkimer, they must have taken a boat a boat across Lake Ontario, and they ended they, and they landed at the. Uh, uh, the port of Oakville, which, which even in those days was a pretty important uh, uh, lake, like Ontario, Lake Ontario port. Yeah. Yeah. They must have had many adventures and mishaps on a more than 100 mile journey. After leaving Guelph, they had to walk. And they must have got a ride to Guelph, but there was nothing north of Guelph. There was, there was nothing between, uh, between Mount Forest, uh, Mount Forest and, and Georgian Bay at, at that time. After leaving, well, they had to walk. Now, we, we didn't, we didn't know how, we do not know how how, how long it took them. Uh, north, north of Guelph, there were no real settlements, just isolated cabins and small clearings, in, in the midst of the surrounding forest. We may be sure that they all stayed close together, knowing that the wild animals and perhaps some unfriendly natives were watching as they followed along. Finally, finally, they reached their destination. The saw game was in full flood, and, and, and how, are, how are they going to cross? There were no bridges, no boats, nothing. but they found a place just east of the trail, where, where it seemed less threatening. The careful just distributing their loads and striving to keep them above the water, and they waded into the river and managed to reach the north side without a mishap. But now, there was another obstacle. They found themselves at the foot of a very steep hill. Nothing daunted, they struggled through the summit, being exhausted after their long trip. And finding the night in chilling air, they were only too glad to spend the night in the deserted Indian wigwam, which, is what, which, was, at the, which was at the hill's summit. When, uh, when, highway, when Highway 6 was, was paved, and uh, I'm not sure when, probably late 20s, early 30s, they, uh, they, they lowered the hill. You'll see the retaining walls along the houses now. That, that hill was much steeper. When, when before years before the, the road was paved. The following morning, May the 1st, 1842, the weary men discussed the situation. Would they stay there or venture further north? Archibald looked at, at the surrounding territory from his vantage point of the hill. The trees were in, were in, in, in spring blossom. The sun sparkled on the water of the Saugeen as it flowed swiftly towards westward. He quickly made his decision. Well, man, he declared, you do as you like in the matter. But I go no further. I take this farm for myself, and I'm one opposite for my son. His companions agreed to follow his example, staking claims to the north and the hunter lands. <laughs> today, today you can see the Karen in the shape of an Indian teepee, marking the place where the first, where the, where the first hardy settlers spent their first night in their future home. I, I suppose you've all seen that. Karen at outside the Anglican Church at the, at the end of Chester Street, Chester Street at least. The, uh, the, 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 the tiny settlement that, that, that happened on the front, the front, there were only two roads at during that time, the the the, the, uh, the, the, the Fair Fraction Road and of course the uh, the, 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 the uh, the, uh, the, the, the Durham Road, Durham Road East West. That was the only, they were doing two, two roads in the area. So of course that, that's where the settlement started. It was a pretty tiny settlement, but it was first known as Hunter's Corners. Of course she was the only one there. And then it, then it became Bentick in 1850. Then Bentick in 1850, it, it became Durham. This was the name of the English town where George Jackson, agent of the Crown Land Office, was born. Although some people will probably argue that it could have been named after Lord, uh, Lord Durham, who was appointed by the British to, uh, to, to, to do a study of the area long before that, to, 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 uh, to uh, find out what, what the prospects were. But the post office was, that was known as Bentick. The post office was on the Bentick side of, of the highway, 
and get a fracture so, so the area was kind of vented. You know, it, was, it wasn't until 1865 that the actual, the actual post office, the post office called authentic, and the government's called authentic in 1965 when they finally decided they better come up here. And then in the, uh, in, in the Queen's Bush, uh, here's, a, here's a copy of the Queen's Bush I got in Victoria, British Columbia. It's a beautiful copy of the Media Matter Dust Jacket. The article refers to, uh, refers to the Queen's Bush. Can't hear you. The, 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 the paper I'm reading from uh, refers to the Queen's Bush a number of times. But uh, the Queen's Bush was written by a doctor, a Dr. Brown. And uh, yeah, I, think he was more, I think he was a better doctor than the story. I, 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 I'm not convinced that well, a lot of things in here are very uh, uh, historically accurate. But the paper I'm reading has been by someone refers to a number of times. But I think, I think the, <laughs> I, think, I think Mr. Kennedy's book on the uh, Pioneer Days is more accurate uh, historical wise than uh, Dr. Brown's Green's book. I brought some of my reference material. You know, I'm not a bookseller, by the way. Uh, so I brought some of some my reference material if you want to uh, look at it later. It's uh, to be able to do on the table. Uh, the Queen's Bush um, uh, by W. M. Brown, M.D., published in 1932. Uh, it, it tells us of the conditions under which the free land grants were given in the district. Each, each would-be owner uh, would have to be over 18 years of age and subject to the Queen Victoria, and, and double grants of 50 acres on each side of the road were offered. 12 acres must be cleared within four years beginning from the 1st January of the following, uh, following the making the claim. In addition, a house at least 18 by 24 feet was to be built on the lot and lived there for at least four years. After that, a title would be given by the Crown. Therefore, after deciding on the land, the hunters began to clear it. They spent that winter, which was an unusually severe one, in the little log shanty they had built. In the spring, they returned to Herkimer, but traveling past well, well, traveling past the shack, well, a, a traveler passing the shack tells us seeing a sign on the door. Every read, "Gone to the United States to bring back my family." So after after um, after Archibald was here for a year, he, he came on his own, like I said, with his with his son and the other three companions. After a year, he went back to Herkimer to bring his seven children, wife and seven children back to the to the new home here in Durham. The following year, the following year, the little group set out anxiously to begin new life in this strange land. A teamster from Arthur Township helped move the family to its new home. The road conditions were still very poor. It took from nearly sunset to the late evening to cross a long swamp north of Mount Forest. This bog, only a mile long, was because of its depth extremely dangerous. Many stories have been told of the wagon sinking in the mud. And their efforts of pioneers using piles of bush to do the oxen footing. How relieved they must have been to overcome this obstacle and realize that they were almost there. After Archibald and his family were settled, he opened his home to travelers, a very welcome action. As there were no other end between Mount Forest and Sydenham, for Owen Sound, beginning a canny, beginning a canny as well as a hospitable Scot. Archibald offered each of his sojourners uh, his, his first drink free. His bar was makeshift but sufficient, a board over a whiskey barrel and a ladle nearby. <laughs> Archibald and Elizabeth had eight children. A baby girl, Mary, had been born in, in, in her community in the States. His eldest daughter, Elizabeth, had married a John Davison, a Scotland pastor. He followed her parents to Upper Canada soon after. They had a baby daughter, another Elizabeth, and John's two boys by the previous marriage. His first wife was a cousin to the second, and her maiden name was also Elizabeth Hunter. It was thought that she may have died on, sh on shipboard. It was interesting to note that John Hunter, his nephew, and John Davison were about the same age. Uh, how do I? 
<clears throat> life was busy. Life was uh, what a busy life that he must have had. Baldy, as of course as Archibald was called, with his hotel and farm. Elizabeth with her large family, having to take care of meals and sleeping quarters for strangers wanting a nice lodging. Although they kept, although they kept very busy with the farm and inn, Archibald still had time for politics. He was the first represent, representative to the, to, the count, to the county council from Bentick and Glen Allen townships when they were combined. The area was then part of Warrington County in the district of Waterloo. He walked too well for council meetings, distance of approximately 60 miles. And, and there was, however, a compensation. He got a dollar a day with no mileage. He was walking to well, six miles. He couldn't claim mileage, but he got a dollar a day for it. <laughs> The, the census of 1852 describes Archibald Hunter as a yeoman and, and the hotel uh, as a, a two-story log building. In 1854, he built a stone hotel the following year or so added a section to the north, which was used as a store. In 1852, also William and, and, and Mary Sinclair had a two-year-old son, Archibald Sinclair Hunter. Evidently, Jean had also married, but she was not listed in the, in the, in the census. The six other children, including Elizabeth Davison and, and their little family, all lived in the log building and served as an inn. At the time of the next census, 1861, they had a stone house. Four stories high, it was built into the hill, with stables underneath, and the balcony around the top floor. Archibald owned four horses and seven pigs for the value of $485. As well, he has three carriages for pleasure. Uh, eventually, the roads were in, evidently the roads were in better condition by that time. Whereas Archibald was described as a yeoman, the next census gives its occupation as hotel and storekeeper. And that volley had a good business sense. <coughs> in reference to his, his self-letting the mail service between Durham and Walkerton in 1865. There was little doubt that he knew how to watch his pennies like a good Scott. The Hunters were quite musical. In the letter, in letter to the Chronicle in 1907, Robert Cochran recalls a concert in the hall of the Hunter store on the next one on tour. Gene Hunter's husband, A.B. McNall, was the leader. The Hunters all took hand in it, and the old gentleman gave us a rural battalion. Mr. Park, the Presbyterian minister, commented on the exceptional ability of William and his brother, Archibald, as presenters. When their eldest son, William, died in, 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 in 18, 1868, at the age of 33, he, he, left, he left three sons, Archibald, James, and John. But the grandparents took the eldest, who was about nine years old, to live with them, which must have been a great help to nurse and Claire Hunter. William's widow. Uh, Elizabeth Hale Hunter died in Durham on the 29th of May. This is Arch Archibald's first wife in 1862. Three months later after her unmarried son Archibald, uh, he already, already married again. He married Margaret Lauder Oliver, a widow with two daughters. She refused to live in the hotel, so he, he built a cottage on the Durham Road, just east of Garifraxi. Uh, this remained in the family until 1968. At that time, it was restored by a tragic fire which came to life of the, of the great granddaughter, Margaret Lauder Hunter. Uh, when Bruce and when Bruce Barber used, were still cutting hair, I used to go there all the time, and uh, I, I learned so much from him and the people who came into the barber shop. Because Bruce, Bruce witnessed that fire in, uh, in January, a very cold morning in January 1968. When Margaret, when Margaret died in the fire. Archibald Sr. Baldy died on September the 3rd, 1878. He was survived by six of his eight children, 36 grandchildren and great-grandchildren. In, in, in his obituary, the Durham Review described him, Mr. Hunter, was essentially a, a public-spirited man and took a lively interest in all the public and social questions which engaged the attention of the people. In his private life, he would be loved by all. His hospitality was well known from lake to lake. 
and his genial welcome to a weary traveler will be fondly remembered by, by very many of the early settlers which were scattered across the Western Peninsula. Thank you. So I, don't, I don't know how much time we have before the next presentation, but you're welcome to come out and look at my progressive material.